Welcome to another installment of Christmas in Quarantine. It's Christmas Past's impromptu miniseries of indeterminate length, all about spreading Christmas cheer during these uncertain times with the COVID-19 crisis. Today is day 22. It is also, technically speaking, episode 104 of Christmas Past. I say technically speaking because that number also includes things I've released as trailers for the upcoming season. But if we're only counting actual episodes of Christmas Past, the 100th episode is still ahead of us. In fact, it's the next one to come out. So I've decided to take a couple of days to put together something very special for you. So I hope you can forgive me for taking a couple days off. Christmas in Quarantine was supposed to be daily, but your 100th episode only happens once, and I want to get it right. I also want to make sure that you're part of it. Sharing your voices on Christmas Past is my favorite thing about doing this show, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to make you part of the celebration. Record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. It could be as simple as a little shout-out to me, a shout-out to a loved one, a Christmas memory, a joke, some tips on being quarantined, really anything that you want to share with the Christmas Past family, because that's what this show is all about. Try to send it to me by Easter so that I can be sure to include it when the episode comes out. Now today we're picking up where we left off yesterday, reading that 1832 story by Miss Mant, Christmas, A Happy Time, a tale calculated for the amusement and instruction of young persons. Last we left off, the Mortimer family was getting ready to have some Christmassy activities now that the boys are home from school. Let's see what transpires during the second half of the story. I'll come back at the end to say goodbye, but for now, get nice and cozy, because once again, it's story time. At that time of year, there was little to be seen out of doors, but one curiosity the Wexfords described, to which they were very anxious to introduce their young friends, and this was a little group of robin redbreasts, which had been hatched in their summer house, and which now took shelter there every night and were regularly fed by the family. The gardener says they do not do us much good, said Maria Wexford, as they approached the summer house, but I do not like that they should be destroyed. Oh no, I could not have them destroyed, replied Harriet Mortimer, even if they spoiled my flowers. They're such pretty creatures. But where are John and Frederick? John and Frederick had scampered off with the young Wexfords and presently returned with a pan of breadcrumbs which they had begged from the cook, and which they had hoped to see the redbreasts eat. But the little creatures were alarmed at seeing so many visitors, or the sun enticed them to extend their flight beyond the greenhouse, for on the entrance of the boys they all took wing and flew away. I'm sorry we frightened them, said Harriet. Do you not think that they will ever come back again? asked Elizabeth. Oh yes, they'll be back in the evening or before, replied Maria Wexford. They often fly out in the daytime when it is fine. But perhaps you would like to run round the garden. You will be cold standing still. The party was preparing for a race when Mr. Mortimer appeared to summon that part of it which belonged to him, and, having arranged a day with Mr. Wexford for the families to meet at Beech Grove, Mr. Wexford and his children returned towards the park. As they approached the sheet of water, which Frederick again surveyed with a longing eye, they perceived that Mr. Wexford's large Newfoundland dog had followed them from the parsonage, and the boys directly began throwing stones and sticks before them for the animal to run after and bring back to them. The dog was particularly fond of water, and John having thrown a stick to the edge of it, it had slipped over the side, and the fine animal immediately sprang after it. The boys for an instant were both inclined to smile at the animal's finding footing when he had expected to sink in the water, but they both turned pale and looked at their father when they almost immediately saw him disappear under the ice. It had been so partially frozen that the weight of the dog in plunging had broken it, and he had sunk to rise no more. Mr. Mortimer's heart sickened as he contemplated what might have been the case had his own children ventured on the ice, and he blessed God that their dispositions were such as to make them obedient to his wishes. Every means were taken for the recovery of the dog, and after some hours he was extricated from the ice, but he was perfectly dead, and apparently had been so for some time. As Mr. Mortimer and his children continued their walk toward the house, they heard a shrill shouting from the direction of the village. It seemed like the shouting of young voices, and was evidently that of joyfulness. The attention of the children was immediately attracted towards it, and Mr. Mortimer indulged them by moving in its direction. 
John and Frederick were very soon out of sight, and in a few minutes they returned to relate the cause of the acclamations they had heard. They proceeded from the children of the parish school, who had just been dismissed by their master and mistress, and were to be treated with a week's holiday. Hurrah, hurrah, cried all the noisy little fellows as Mr. Mortimer came up, while the squeaking voices of the little girls joined in the cry at the same time as they jumped and danced and frisked about happy and joyous as little birds. The young Mortimers hastened toward the gate, and as they opened it, the young crowd gave them another hurrah, and two or three of the biggest of the boys approached and making their village nods to the squire, at the same time touching their hats, they offered their Christmas pieces for exhibition. Mr. Mortimer gave these little lads sixpence each, and calling to the gardener to get him a few shillings worth of halfpence from the village shop, he bade the happy group of children stop a few minutes near the gate. This they were glad to do, and on the return of the gardener, John and Frederick, commissioned by their father, gave each of the little girls two pence, and Harriet and Elizabeth had the same pleasing commission to execute toward the boys. All was joy and hilarity, and when Mr. Mortimer told them that on Christmas Day they were to come to his house, to have some beef and plum pudding, all the little happy countenances shone with delight. And now run on and get home, said Mr. Mortimer, for your parents will be waiting for you at their dinners, and take care you do not get into any mischief in the course of the next week. And if you go out and slide, mind that the ice is well hardened before you venture on it. And a Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas to you, sir, replied the biggest boy, who was a very well-spoken lad and looked as happy, though he made less noise than the rest. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas was echoed from a number of little voices around him, and with another joyous shout, the motley group proceeded onwards through the village. Mr. Mortimer now left his children and proceeded through the village where he had himself business to transact. The children went into the house to get their luncheon of bread and jam, and after the girls had rested themselves their mother promised to take a stroll with them and their brothers round the garden and through the greenhouses. At this time of year there was little to see, but still what little there was was worth seeing, and a stroll with Mama was always a treat. What piles of shirts and round frocks, Mama, said John, while they were eating at their luncheon, and what numbers of frocks, why, you might set up a shop almost. Cannot you guess what these frocks and shirts are all for, said Harriet? I can, said the quick little Frederick. They are for the children we saw in the lane just now, and they are going to have them against Christmas. You are right, Frederick, replied his mother, and I have been taking the opportunity of this holiday of your sisters to look them over and parcel them out. Just now the door opened and a housemaid appeared with a large basket of shoes and stockings, and another of the women's gowns and men's frocks. How pleased all the poor people will be, Mama, said Elizabeth, taking up a gown from the basket. It is rather coarse cloth, though, I think, Mama. It would be very coarse for you to wear, Elizabeth, replied Mrs. Mortimer, because you are born in a state of affluence, and therefore it is becoming that you should be dressed according to the fortune of your papa. But to give fine garments to the poor would be no kindness to them, nor a fit manner of shewing our benevolence toward them. I think Papa is very good and kind, do not you, Mama? said Harriet, looking very steadfastly at her mother. Your father has a great pleasure in benefiting anyone it is in his power to serve, and is, as you observe, Harriet, one of the kindest of men. But he does no more than his duty, and this he would himself tell you, in being vigilant guardian over the necessities of his poor neighbors. Providence has placed a large fortune at his disposal, and one end of its being given was that he might clothe the naked and feed the hungry. Christmas would not be a time of much rejoicing to the poor were not the rich to assist them in making it so, and I hope all my dear children, while they are enjoying themselves with every comfort and indulgence around them, will be rendered happier by reflecting that the inhabitants of every cottage in the village are rejoicing at the same time. We shall not have a party on Christmas Day, shall we, Mama? asked John. None excepting our own family, John, replied Mrs. Mortimer. I hope both your uncles will be with us, and your grandpapa and grandmama have promised to come over from Cannon Hill. The Mortimers from Haversley, too, I expect, and these, I think, will complete our circle round the Christmas fire. Oh, I hope grandpapa will come, said Frederick, because he has always such a number of battles and fighting stories to tell, and he is so droll besides. And I am sure Uncle Philip will come, said Elizabeth for he is so fond of play and jumping me up to the ceiling. 
I think you're getting almost too big for this play, said Mrs. Mortimer, and so Uncle Philip would feel in his arms, I believe, were he to attempt to jump you now. We shall all dine with you then, Mama, shall we not? asked Elizabeth. If there is no other company, you know they are relations and all fond of us children. You shall all dine in the room, certainly, said Mrs. Mortimer, but if the four young Mortimers come, I think some of you will be obliged to dine at the side table, but that none of you will mind. Oh, we don't mind that at all, Mama, said Harriet. But we had rather not have any of the Mortimers with us, for they are so rude and noisy, and Papa always thinks that we make the noise, and I am sure it is always their fault, although we cannot help laughing at them. You see in the instance of your cousins, Harriet, said Mrs. Mortimer, the disadvantage of never having any restraint put on little girls' educations. I myself have seen that they occasionally are boisterous and overbearing in their manners, but the fault is not their own. And if you remember, one day when they were with us, without their own father and mother, they were as orderly and well-behaved as possible. But will you never have finished your luncheon, Frederick? I was so hungry, Mama, replied the little boy. But I have done now, and now shall we go out again? Did you call on Nurse this morning? said Mrs. Mortimer. No, Mama, I quite forgot her, replied Frederick. But we will go now, shall we, John, while Mama finishes sorting the things? You must never forget her, my dear boy, replied the tender mother, for without her care of you, when your own mother was too weak to attend to you, you would not have been the stout, active boy you are now. I hope you have a nice gown and petticoat for nurse, Mama, said Frederick. She has not been forgotten, replied Mrs. Mortimer, and you shall have the pleasure of carrying the bundle prepared for her yourself. There it is, the cotton gown and stuffed petticoat, the shoes, stockings, and apron lying together at the corner of the table. Frederick, with a little of his mother's assistance, soon made these separate articles into a bundle, and the two boys set off for Nurse Winscombe's cottage. The stroll round the garden did not take place on that day, for the boys met their father returning from the cottage of the nurse, and he took them with him to call on a gentleman residing about two miles distant, and whose family were to be invited, with a few others, to meet together in the Christmas week. The young people were to be indulged with a little dance, and although neither John nor Frederick knew much about dancing, they were pleased at the idea of joining with those who did, and already began to talk over the little young ladies of the neighborhood and to settle with whom they would and with whom they would not dance. They came home quite tired and only in time to have their dress changed before dinner. Harriet and Elizabeth thought that they had been absent a long while and on their return into the drawing room were ready with their smiling countenances to receive these dear boys. The next morning after breakfast, Mr. Mortimer employed a few hours in examining his boys in the improvements they had made during the last half year, for he had wisely resolved, for the comfort of the whole family, that the entire day was not to be given up to play. During this time, Harriet and Elizabeth were occupied with their mama, and after this, as the day continued bright, though cold, it was determined to put into effect the proposed stroll of yesterday and first to the farmyard where the poultry maid supplied them with corn. And with this enticement, the fowls and ducks were called together and numbered, and the various beauties of them both enumerated. This speckled hen had been such a good mother, and a good handful of grains was tossed to her. Then the beautiful little bantam had been nursed in a stocking, and was so tame that it would come and eat out of the hand. Then there was the fine old cock that crowed so loud he might be heard all over the parish, and a handful of was thrown to him. Then there was the young one, which the old one drove about so that it could not get anything to eat. Harriet made his necessities her care, but it was useless to throw him any, for the old cock would not allow him to come near the grain. Nasty, greedy fellow, said Elizabeth. I am sure there's enough for all, but the young cock cannot get a morsel. I believe we must get rid of him, observed Mrs. Mortimer, for it is miserable to see him driven about so. He is to be killed next, madam, answered the poultry maid, who now approached with two fowls hanging from her hands, from which drops of blood were falling. Mrs. Mortimer moved away with the children, for she saw that Harriet turned pale at the sight of the blood. I cannot think how Jane can kill the fowls, mamma, said Elizabeth. I am sure I could not, if we never had any at all. I should be very sorry if you could, my dear little girl, for there is no necessity for your doing it, and without conquering your feelings of tenderness, you never could acquire the resolution to do it. 
In Jane's situation, it was necessary for her to habituate herself to an employment which devotes to her as the rearer of the poultry. But I assure you it was a long time before she could first bring herself to deprive those creatures of life which she had been accustomed to look after and feed. And even now, I believe, when she can meet with the gardener or groom, she most generally employs them. Are there no ducks, Mama? said Frederick. We used to have such a number. There is your old favorite Drake just stopping under the gate, replied Mrs. Mortimer, and we will follow him into the field, for it is rather cold standing still. They then went into the field, and after that came round to the greenhouse, where the gardener was very busily employed in gathering some beautiful grapes. How nice and warm it is here, said several of the children on entering the house. The gardener then approached to ask the young gentlemen how they did, and to tell them how much they were grown and to say that he hoped that they would like the grapes. John and Frederick answered all the old man's questions with kindness and civility, and as the young party were leaving the greenhouse, he asked them whether they should not want some flowers and evergreens against their little dance. Oh yes, if you please, gardener, was the ready and quick answer. We may, mamma, may we not, said Harriet, looking up at her mother before she gave a reply. The gardener may give you what he can spare, replied Mrs. Mortimer. And Gardner, added she, looking back toward the greenhouse, desire your grandson to go into the copses and bring home a little cart of holly, that we may have the kitchen well ornamented when the tenantry come to their dinner. He shall be sure to do it, ma'am, replied the gardener. I look we shall have a merry Christmas, and I do like to see the room well dressed up. As Tom, the gardener's grandson, was a steady, well-behaved lad, Mrs. Mortimer allowed John and Frederick to accompany him to the copses, in search of the holly. Harriet and Elizabeth would, no doubt, very much have liked to belong to the party also, but they were easily convinced of the propriety of their not doing so, and were therefore satisfied to see their brothers drive off with Tom Harding and return in two or three hours afterwards, walking by the side of the little vehicle which then appeared a moving shrub of red-buried holly. On Christmas Day, the expected party met round the hospitable dinner table of Mr. Mortimer, having all of them arrived on the preceding day at the Grove, excepting the other branch of the Mortimer family who attended their own parish church in the morning and did not arrive till the hour of dinner. The children of the village school, all in their new clothes and with a sprig of holly in their bosoms and buttonholes, walked from the church to the Grove and there partook, as they had been invited to do, of beef and pudding and good home-brewed beer. The young Mortimers waited upon them at dinner, and before they left the lodge, presented them each with a plum cake, and Mrs. Mortimer gave them each an amusing little book to read to themselves and their parents, who had, not like themselves, possessed the advantages of learning to read. The family dinner party went off as happily as that in the kitchen. The young Mortimers all sat together at the side table, and the papa had not once occasion to call them out for being noisy, though they were merry and cheerful enough. It was certainly true, as Harriet had said, that her cousins would be noisy. On this day, however, being dispersed among the party at the large table, they were very orderly and well-behaved, and after dinner, when the young people had had taken as much fruit as was good for them, they retired into their playroom together. They sat round the blazing fire there provided for them, very comfortably and happily, and without one word of dissension, till they were again called back for tea into the drawing room. The next day was the day appointed for the dinner of the tenantry, and busy indeed were the young Mortimers in dressing up the hall and making it look smart and lively. A very large party assembled here to enjoy the squire's hospitable table at which he himself presided. And the day after this, the laboring cottagers and their wives met in the same room at one o'clock, round a table well covered with meat pies, legs of mutton, roast beef, potatoes, and plum pudding. They brought with them those of their children, who were too young to be in the school, and on this occasion all the new round frocks and cotton gowns were exhibited. Little Frederick led his nurse up to the head of the table and was very attentive to her, and whenever her plate was empty, he took care that it should not remain so long. The party went off as happily as the last, and two days after was to take place the little dance, so anxiously looked forward to not only by the Mortimers, but by all the young people of the neighborhood. The Wexfords came very early in the morning to assist their young friends in preparing the ballroom, and the gardener had taken good care to provide plenty of shrubs and flowers for the necessary decoration. Mrs. Mortimer lent her assistance where it was required, 
and she was only fearful that her children would tire themselves before the pleasure of the evening commenced. For Mr. Mortimer had now pronounced the sheet of water in the park sufficiently frozen to bear any weight that might be ventured on it, and he had given several village lads permission to slide there, and prepare it for the use of his own boys. He now called upon both his own lads and the young Wexfords to join him, and for John he had provided a pair of skates. John met with a great many tumbles to the amusement not only of himself but also of his companions, but he had no serious bruises and soon jumped up and laughed at his own awkwardness. Frederick longed to try the skates out. Mr. Mortimer thought him too little to venture upon them, so that he was obliged to be satisfied with sliding. And very prettily he did slide, and very much did Elizabeth wish to slide with him, for she was indeed a merry little girl, besides being always desirous of doing everything which she saw her brother Frederick engaging in. But Mama thought it not very fit amusement for little girls, so Elizabeth joined Harriet and the Miss Wexfords in a run round the park, all of them occasionally returning to the ice to see how the skaters and sliders went on. The hour of dinner was a very early one on this day, for the evening party was to be an early one. The young people with their papas and mamas began to assemble at a very unfashionable hour, as early indeed as seven o'clock, and by eight they were all dancing away very merrily. Dancing was kept up with great spirit towards eleven. Then there was a summons to supper. Another hour was spent in taking refreshments, and during this time there was such merriment and many jokes passing around, as well amongst the elder part of the assembly, as in that with which we are more particularly interested. Soon after twelve the party began to separate. All had appeared to be very well satisfied with the pleasure that they had been enjoying. Everyone seemed in high good humor and glee and all the young visitors, as well as the four Mortimers, joined in acknowledging that the dance had gone off very well indeed, and in pronouncing that certainly Christmas was a very happy time. Thanks so much for joining me for another installment of Christmas in Quarantine. Now again, no new episode tomorrow because I'm preparing something special for my 100th episode. That also means you have a little extra time to make sure that you are included in it. Record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Until we meet again, let me remind you as always that Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California by yours truly, Brian Earle. Reach out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and please do join the private Christmas Past Facebook group if you haven't yet. If you're enjoying Christmas in quarantine, I'll bet you have other people in your life who could also use a little Christmas spirit right now. So why not help more people discover this show? It's like spreading Christmas cheer, and all you have to do is tell a friend about it or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. These are quick and painless ways to show your support, and they really do make a big difference. If you do leave a review on Apple Podcasts, I will send you an official Christmas past sticker and a handwritten Christmas card as my way of saying thanks. Until next time, stay safe and healthy, look out for one another, and may your days be merry and bright.